here with Margaret Owen, author of The Merciful Crow, her first uh, YA novel, official. Tell us about the main characters that are in it. There's three of them, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, so the story is primarily about Phi. I mean, it's from her, from her point of view. And Phi is a girl who was born into the lowest of the castes in her kingdom, the crows, who serve as these plague doctors, like, not exactly plague doctors, but mostly mercy killers, because they're the only folks, or the only cast in the kingdom who are immune to a lethal plague. Like, there's no coming back from it. It will kill you if you get it. But it's also believed to only strike bad people. And a lot of the country has made assumptions about the crows based on the fact that they're immune to it. Oh. And she is a witch, which means uh, she also has the ability that is only for the group well, it's it's slightly Facebook complicated. Um, all the all the casts have an ability called a birthright, and witches of the cast have a more um, more powerful version of that birthright. Okay. Except for the crows, don't have any birthright at all. And Fly, or like, but the witches have the ability to basically tap into another cast's birthright through their teeth. Or like through their bones, <laughs> like okay. they can call that magic out of their bones. Okay. But I mean, it can't be part of the person, and like it has to be like a you know something that's from someone you know it's not no longer connected to the person. They can't like reach in and be like I'm it's like I'm gonna just control your magic. Okay. So um, they, I mean, obviously walking around with a bag of fevers is not the most practical, <laughs> and so they usually will accept teeth as forms of payment when people have absolutely nothing else to pay with. Ah. And uh, so that's that's about Phi. She can she has this really cool ability to basically tap into different kinds of magic. Okay. But uh, she's also keenly aware of the circumstances that the crows are dealing with, which is they, they live in a society that does not welcome them, but it does need them. And so their their caste isn't limited to. Um, they're, they're restricted by that. They're restricted in things that they can do. Like they can't carry. Uh, actual working weapons. They they are like discouraged from like staying too long in one place. Okay. And so they have to they face a lot of um, persecution as part of their life that's been sort of neglected and ignored by the rest of the cast or encouraged. That's our first character, Phi, who is very angry about basically one hundred percent of all that. Everything. <laughs> Our other two main characters are the Prince Jasper, mm -hmm. who is um, he is the heir to the throne. His mother died a few years ago. His father remarried, and his stepmother is a terrifying woman who very clearly wants the throne for herself. And um, she is willing to do whatever it takes to Jasper to get him out of the way. And so um, he basically fakes his death with the help of his bodyguard and body double, Tavin. Uh, and Tavin is of the hot cast, and Jasper is from the Royal Phoenix cast. Okay. And Tavin and Jasper, I, I love them very much. They are <laughs> complicated characters in their own ways, because Jasper has lived this life where he's been told his divine right is to be the next king of this country, okay. and that he's special because of where he was born. Which makes him an interesting foil for Phi, who uh. has been told her entire life that she just like she her life is a punishment for you know because of what she's been born as uh, okay. and they they definitely clash quite a bit um, I, I should also clarify um jasper is gay i has absolutely no interest in him okay okay yeah and uh jasper absolutely has no interest in her whatsoever so that like that takes for me that was also an interesting thing to remove that component of he doesn't he is not compelled to try to emphasize with her or empathize with her through romantic attraction, okay, which I think yeah. can motivate people a yeah. little more. Yeah. <laughs> so when Jasper asks Fi for help escaping his terrifying stepmother, uh, his plan is to just sort of casually disguise himself as a crow and flee across the country. Okay, yeah. And um, Fi is like, that's going to be a lot more complicated than I think you think it's going to go. <laughs> but also, I want to see what happens. Right. But also, she extracts a, a holy oath from him that he is, once he, or if, she, if they do this for him, then once he's on the throne, he will protect the crows and address what's happened to them in a way that no one from his dynasty ever has. Okay. And then his bodyguard, Tavin, is the third main character. He is a 
delightful pansexual boy. <laughs> okay. Who is love interest. Um, okay. But he's also sort of struggled with this thing where he is Jasmine's body double, and he's been raised with this idea that he's like the best thing that he can do in his life is die for the future of the country. And so uh, he's he's very much the kind of guy who's like, I'm going to crack a whole bunch of jokes to. <laughs> gloss over all the horrible feelings. I've so he uh, he understands that he's like the expendable one exactly. for the most part. Exactly. The red shirt. Exactly. Exactly. Call it. <laughs> exactly. Which is what like the, the color that's associated with the hawks is literally red. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so he's he's a fun character, but he's also a challenging one because he does come from a place of a lot of privilege. Yeah. The hawks. The, the the cast that he's part of are relatively high up in the hierarchy. And he doesn't understand that a lot of what we, or a lot of the issues that the crows have, can't be fixed by hawks because the hawks are actively participating in the issues that they're fixing. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are participants in the persecution that the crows are facing. Okay, so that's a, that is a very long way of explaining our first or three B characters. No problem. Uh, I guess would, would you say that one of them, any of them, were like closer to you than as far as like the others? Um, I would say, I mean, just by nature of her being the POV character, Phi is of course very close to me, and like a lot of what she goes through about being angry about just being told this is the way things are, and you were born this way, so, or you know, this is what you were born as, and you just have to deal with that, and that's what, that's just how it is for you people. Yeah. But going, like, writing through that, I was writing through a lot of my own anger, like, you know? Okay. This is, this is, <laughs> this is, it's such is it okay if I swear? <laughs> but that whole idea, like, this is just how it is for people like you, mm -hmm. it's such bullshit. Yeah. And then, like, I wanted this idea, or to want to push back on that idea, or in through Fi, I did, of just her saying, is it, you know, is it really a punishment that, or like, for, or am I supposed to be, like, is, is my, like, my, the, the circumstances I'm born into, are they supposed to be a divine punishment, or are they a punishment because, you know, the king has let this go unchecked? Yeah. And so, fine, absolutely. There's definitely a lot I sympathize with, with both Jasimer and Tavin, too, because Tavin, as, you know, the sort of bodyguard character, feels a lot of the compulsion to sacrifice a lot of himself okay. in order to make, keep things moving and make things go, but yeah. keep, them, keep them going, and sort of like balance between two very, uh, <laughs> very polar opposites. He's the, he's the social ball bearing between the two, between like, Fi and the prince. Yeah. And with Jasimer, there's definitely a, like a lot of him that I sympathize with, and there's a lot of my former self in like as I've you know sort of been becoming more aware of my own privilege. A lot of the discussions or like a lot of the arguments that he makes are tapped directly from like the my own internal dialogue when I was coming through that stuff. And like now in retrospect, I'm like that was a super shitty thing to say, <laughs> or that you know, I was totally looking at it the wrong way. Uh -huh. But that, that part of it is, you know, it's a part of me that, as Jasmine worked through that, so did I. Well, uh, <laughs> I worked through that before Jasmine. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but, you know, there's But definitely... seeing it through Jasmine, and then he's exactly. like, oh, okay. <laughs> as you, as you, the, a lot of his unpacking of his own privilege is, you know, it, it reflects a lot of the processes that I went through. Okay. So, hey. well, this has been your first book and stuff. Um, <laughs> can you tell us the process of the queries, queries and, like, like, how many you went through kind of... <laughs> How were you able to get through that? Because I mean, obviously, it's not like the first time you get an exception, exception already, you know? Right. It's so. Bear with me here. Uh -huh. The Merciful Crow was a little bit of an outlier, <laughs> um, and it was it was not the first manuscript that I ever tried to get published. Okay. And that one was way more typical of an experience where I so with my first manuscript I wrote the book. It was grotesquely long. I didn't do a lot of research on, uh -huh. <laughs> on what I should be doing, like word count and genre conventions and all that. And I spent about... The process for The Merciful Crow was significantly different. Okay. I, I went into it planning for the completely normal, reasonable timeline of taking a year to land an agent which is, can be sometimes even like a little ambitious, and then taking another year on submission. And uh, 
Because like, it, it's a tough process because editors are so busy. They just, like, the time that they have to devote to new manuscripts is probably lo- low at the bottom of their piles. Like, oh, stuff okay. that they are already working on, stuff that yeah. hasn't been announced that they're working on. Okay, yeah, yeah. And then, like, all the day to day stuff. So, it can be, it can be, it, the submission can take a while. Okay. And, uh, so, that's, that's the timeline that I plan on. It's like another two years to even see a deal. That is not how went down <laughs> and for anyone who it takes longer than that for I definitely want to or like, you know like, for, for anyone who says oh well if it doesn't sell fast it's not going to sell at all absolute nonsense you know like some amazing books took a while to sell um, but for me what happened is I entered the manuscript into a pitch contest and okay. it got like a pretty enthusiastic agent response and after sending out a, you know, sending, responding to, sending out the manuscript to the folks who asked for it, uh, I was getting some pretty positive feedback okay. from agents. At which point, I was like, I think this might be, a, I think I might have something here, something yeah. might be happening with this. And I was like, I need to make sure that I get every agent who I would die if I didn't query. <laughs> I need to make sure that they all get a query in their inbox ASAP. Which was a great move because the next day I got an offer of representation. Oh. And wow. the thing that is very sort of gauche to do is get an offer of representation and then query other agents anyway. Oh. So, um, the, so the, the, the thing that you want to do is like once you get an offer of representation, you want to make sure that you've queried everyone that you want to query. Okay. Um, because it's just, it's kind of, it's like accepting a job offer and then like continuing to send it your Yeah, design, exactly, you know? yeah. And so um, I wound up, like, or I unfortunately had to then notify all the agents that I just queried the day before, that, <laughs> which looks super shady. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, I'm so sorry, yeah, this looks bad, but I just got an offer of representation, so you gotta bump this and get, you gotta get to this in the next two weeks, otherwise, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and, uh, and then I brought up with like a bunch of agent offers and uh, had a bunch of conversations with amazing people and wound up signing with my agents. I think the pitch contest was in late February, early March, signed with my agent, I want to say April. Okay. And then um, we, I, I draft really clean and so we were able to go out of stuff pretty fast and then it would be by the end of June and gone to auction. And by July, I was able to walk into my supervisor's office and be like, well, I have notice for you. <laughs> I'm not going to be here for a time. Uh, that's, that's always, always nice, nice, I'm sure. <laughs> I have yet to find this, you know, if we get that, but that's awesome. Um, and, and basically, you know, fantasy is such a, you know, it's, such a nice, it's an interesting yes. genre. You know, you get to create your own world. Exactly. And it's, it's amazing. Um, what were your inspirations for your fantasy world? And like, you know, like, yeah, who are your, or what were your inspirations? <laughs> so I, one thing that I'm trying to be uh, hypersensitive about, and I try uh, perhaps almost a little too hard to avoid is doing something that's too close to something else that's coming out. Like, yeah. I probably won't do an assassin book for a while if I do. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, like, I definitely yeah. won't touch fairs for a while. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's, it's just because there's someone actively doing it and doing it really well. Yeah, know? yeah, I get it. But um, with it, so in order to do that, when I see something like, you know, when I see a piece of media that I like, I try to analyze what I like about it uh-huh. and then be like, all right, so how can I do that in a new way? And so that's, you know, usually how I approach world building is like, what can I do? Like, what, what about this do I like? Mm-hmm. Like, what can I do that doesn't just lift this concept wholesale, you know, file the serial numbers off and yeah. then call it a day? And the biggest thing, I think, there were, there were a couple different factors. I'd always thought playing doctors were interesting. I always, there were, like, I had recently watched Beasts of the Southern Wild, which is just the most atmospheric movie, like, I have ever seen. If yeah. you ever want a movie that's like, just cut off a slice of atmosphere and just stretch it out. <laughs> yeah. even, it, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous movie, and it, it, it'll make you cry like a baby, like, you know, <laughs> all good movies do. But, um, I wanted to write something that was that kind of atmospheric, and it almost felt mystical, you know, had a very, yeah. sort of, 
very specific, like, oh, this is, you know, this is a feeling that I don't quite understand, but it's, but it's there. So I wanted to, but I was also like, okay, so what, what do I do with these ideas? You know, this, this, this gives me nothing. This isn't a lot. And then um, the sort of final concept that sort of clicked everything into place was an article that I came across about the lives of medieval executioners. And it was talking about the things that they, like the, the rules they had to live by, the things that they were allowed to take into payment, and like how they were allowed to feed themselves and their families, because like amazingly, not the most lucrative <laughs> occupation, cutting off people's heads. You yeah, know? yeah. But also they couldn't live as part of the communities that they served, and they, there's a whole excerpt in a book about this, about how they could basically walk through a marketplace, but they had to have some kind of thing that identified them as an executioner or part of the executioner's family. Mm. And uh, the executioner himself could point at merchandise that he wanted to claim, and like people were expected to give it to him. He wasn't allowed to touch it because the copy, just the concept of what he did was considered so unclean mm. that it would be not of like contaminating the merchandise. Okay. And there, was, I was just reading through this. Uh, yesterday about how there was a sort of fun sort of standoff where if the executioner was like, I want that item, and the merchant was like, uh, sorry, then the executioner could just sort of pretend that he was going to touch it anyway, and, oh. <laughs> and, like, and the merchant could then either be like, you gotta go, dude, or, um, like, all right, fine, take it because I don't want you to like, get the rest of the merchandise dirty. Exactly. Which is hilarious to me. But like, there's this sort of there were there was things like that. There was um, rules about like they had the exclusive rights <laughs> rights to clean cesspools, but then they got to keep anything they found in them. And like, the oh, rights, right? right. <laughs> right? <laughs> Hopefully, you wash it up first. Yeah, <laughs> right. But they also had first claim to stray animals, or if someone had like if they found like a dead dog, they had first claim to the hide, which was actually pretty valuable because it was gonna be turned into okay, hide. okay. And so it was all these weird things where you're like stray animal, that sounds weird. Like dead animal, weirder. Yeah. Or, like if you have to carry something that shows what you are, okay. And it sounds like this very weird sort of ritualistic thing, but there's all this reasoning and meaning behind it. Okay. But the clearest thing to me was how they were expected to serve this community but also kept completely apart from it. Yeah. And so that's when I was like, I think I know where this needs to go. But also, I don't want it to be about this family of executioners because it's like, really, I don't want them to be stuck to one city. Because mm -hmm. that just seems like, you know, how many, how many people are you going to execute? Yeah. Like, that sounds yeah. pretty grim. And so that's when uh, I was like, okay, why would an execution need to, need to travel though? Like, and like, how would how would that how would that that even function? How would they be summoned? Uh -huh. And what if it wasn't a, an execution they were traveling for, but the outbreak of the plague? Yeah. But why okay. would they need to kill someone with the plague if they had, unless they had absolute certainty that they couldn't recover from it? And then that's where it, that, that's how it just all starts snowballing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um. All right. So we're at Comic Con, and basically, um, the, we have a bunch of fandoms and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what are you a fan of as well? Oh, man. So I'm relatively easy to please when it comes to fandoms. Uh, I can say that, and then of course, someone will be like, "Have you watched this?" And I'm like, "No." Have you watched this? Have you watched this? I have absolutely zero interest in that. But I will say, uh, I'm a big weed. I I majored in Japanese, and uh, I was just the biggest anime and manga fan. Okay. And I don't, I'm, like, I'm not as avid as I was, but like there's, you know, there's some shows that I still oh, yeah. keep up with, oh, yeah. uh, like Sailor Moon. Uh. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Captain Sakura was really fun, and My Hero Academia uh -huh. is uh -huh. such a great show. <laughs> and in terms of television, you know, like, I love The Good Place. I, I, I love the fact that they have philosophical discussions in The Good Place, <laughs> and it's a fun engaging educational show and people are learning things and they don't even know <laughs> that to me is just a magic trick <laughs> like, oh, hey, right love that brooklyn 99 like i could go down the list but like i i tend to like things that uh, have sort of a lot of layers and levels to them where like one of my favorite things about brooklyn 99 is you actually see 
the the one childish, immature white dude actually grow over the course of the show. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And like it starts as him being very sort of like, oh, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a the, the crack shot genius detective, but also. My desk is a mess because I can't do much to clean it up. And isn't that fun and quirky? And over the like, you can see like the writers actually becoming more sort of self-aware too, which is great. Um, but they, you know, they actually develop his character and like they develop all the other characters. And there's, it's a it's a show where there's two Latino women in, in the main cast. There are two black men, one of whom is the openly gay captain of the force. Okay. Yeah, which, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's always the sort of conflict of, like, okay, well, this is a show about cops. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> how do I feel about that? And they've been really good about being like, we need to actually talk about police brutality, and we need to talk about the NYPD, uh-huh. and, like, doing stop and frisk, and we need to talk about the issues that are actually relevant to, like, you know, that people are criticizing the police for, because they have good reason to do so. And so I love shows like that where it'll take something, you know, it'll take a, a fun concept, but it'll also elevate it. And yeah. it doesn't even have to be necessarily a fun concept. It could be, uh, it can be grim, or it can be like surprisingly deep, like Steven Universe. Love that show. That show has personally attacked me <laughs> many, many times. <laughs> so yeah, I, I love stuff like that. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, and uh, and uh, and well, I should say uh, you you didn't want to reveal book two's title. Mm-hmm. However, it is on Goodreads, I'm, 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 <laughs> and I'm like, how interesting that they would show book two's title and book one hasn't even come out. Um, but it, it, it gives a it it says it's like a, a certain um, hint. Or a tease as to what to expect. Uh huh. And I would say, okay. <laughs> so there's a particular dynamic with the first book's title that when you think about it a little bit, not a little bit, like that, that doesn't sound <laughs> that sounds condescending. Well, you think about it a little bit, but like when you sort of reflect on the, the course of the book and you reflect on the meaning of the words in the title. You, there, it takes on a different sort of dimension. Yeah. Book two's title is also like that. So, <laughs> without spoiling anything. Like anything yeah. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that then. Thank you so much, Margaret, for your time. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.